Thank you all for joining us today. I'm, I'm Frank Hoke. I head the communications office at Rockefeller University. And this is, of course, a thrilling day for all of us at Rockefeller, but most especially for Dr. Charles Rice, his family, his friends, and his colleagues. For the benefit of the journalists listening in today, I want to give you a few details about this press conference, and then I'll turn over the podium to uh, Rockefeller University's president, Dr. Rick Lifton, who will introduce Dr. Rice. Dr. Rice will then offer some brief remarks. Following those remarks, we will be able to take questions from reporters who should submit the questions for consideration via the Q&A function on their screens. Please do hold your questions until the conclusion of Dr. Rice's remarks and then identify yourself and your outlet when you submit the question. You will also find updated information about Dr. Rice and his research on our website, rockefeller.edu, including a selection of photos and videos. Thanks for your attention. I'd now like to invite our president, Dr. Rick Lifton, to say a few words. Rick. Thank you very much, Frank. I can't uh, tell you how thrilled I am to uh, share uh, with you this morning uh, the announcement from the Nobel Prize Foundation that Charlie Rice, uh, Maurice and Corinne Greenberg Professor in Virology and Head of the Laboratory of Virology and Infectious Disease at Rockefeller University, uh, was named recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Uh, as you know, Charlie is sharing this award uh, with Harvey Alter of the National Institutes of Health and Michael Houghton of the University of Alberta, Canada. The award recognizes their discovery of the hepatitis C virus. The hepatitis C virus uh, is a virus that causes uh, infection of the liver. Uh, many patients are able to uh, fight off the virus, uh, but uh, to date, uh, today there are about 70 million people worldwide who have chronic infection of the liver with the hepatitis C virus. Uh, and this causes progressive liver disease uh, that leads to uh, liver failure, is a contributor to development of uh, hepatocellular cancer, uh, and results in uh, death of about 400,000 people uh, worldwide uh, prior to the work of uh, these investigators. So Alter and Houghton had originally cloned and characterized the genome of the hepatitis C virus uh, in 1989. And this was a major advance that enabled identification of people who were infected with the virus and elimination of the virus uh, from the world's blood supply. Uh, this was a very important advance. Nonetheless, uh, for years afterward, efforts to propagate the virus in liver cells uh, failed. And as a consequence, uh, the ability to screen for drugs that might inhibit the replication of the virus uh, were virtually impossible. Charlie recognized uh, from his work on related viruses uh, that the reason for this was likely that the very end of the hepatitis C virus was likely missing from the clone virus uh, to date. And he devised a series of ingenious experiments to uh, eventually enable him to identify and characterize the very uh, end of the virus, which turned out to be the key for the initiation of replication of the virus, which he published in 1996. And in 1997, demonstrated that uh, this extended version of the virus uh, was capable of producing uh, infection uh, in uh, primates and uh, as well as in cells. And this enabled uh, Charlie to go on and devise clever cellular methods for uh, inter pr producing the virus uh, in cells and being able to screen for inhibitors of the virus in cell-based assays, which the pharmaceutical industry has gone on to use uh, to devise uh, new drugs that effectively treat this virus. And today it's uh, quite remarkable that uh, this chronic uh, viral illness uh, can be effectively treated with a short course uh, currently of three drugs, which are highly effective uh, in eradicating the virus in the overwhelming majority of affected individuals. Uh, so this is a, a remarkable advance of uh, science and Charlie's work is, uh, in my view, extraordinarily beautiful and uh, uh, thorough and uh, highly deserving of this uh, remarkably prestigious uh, award. And I just want to add my congratulations uh, to the words of uh, everybody else uh, who uh, uh, is passing Charlie's way uh, today. Uh, this uh, advance uh, it will ultimately enable saving millions of lives uh, worldwide. Uh, so uh, Charlie's work um, uh, is the embodiment of Rockefeller's credo, uh, science for the benefit of humanity, and we're also extraordinarily proud of Charlie. So now if I could ask uh, Charlie to uh, join the discussion, uh, I might just start by asking uh, Charlie, uh, 
early morning wake up, I gather. Uh, how did you hear the news? Well, the, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm live now, uh, barely alive. Um, but uh, no, the, 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 the phone um, started ringing, our landline in the living room started ringing at, at 4.30. And um, initially I was, uh, well, I was irritated that uh, somebody would be calling at 4.30 in the morning. And uh, I, I figured it was, you know, either a crank phone call or, you know, possibly uh, a, a sprinkler test in the hospital or uh, emergency power uh, or a minus 80 freezer in the lab warming up and a, a crisis. And so I, I actually didn't, didn't pick up the phone and I started heading back to bed and um, it, it rang again, and uh, this time I sort of fumbled around and actually sort of pushed the button on the phone that uh, sort of made the connection. And there was this uh, this uh, voice with a Swedish accent uh, on the phone. And then I was pretty much convinced that this was definitely a, a crank phone call. Um, but um, this was the secretary, I guess, of the Nobel Committee who was, who was informing me of this. And when he mentioned that, uh, Sort of my friends and colleagues, uh, Harvey Alter and Mike Houghton were uh, also being recognized uh, sort of with this prize. Uh, it started to sink in that this might actually be real. Um, uh, and then basically after, after a chat with him, I, he said, well, if you don't believe me, uh, actually just sort of go to, the, go to the Nobel sort of site and in an hour, uh, hopefully we'll convince you that this is you know, sort of not, uh, not a crank call. So anyway, that's that's the way I heard about it. And and did you go back to bed and get to sleep after that? Uh, no. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, and I'll try and not doze off during the uh, press conference. But uh, <laughs> you no, know, it was it was a little bit difficult to uh, sort of uh, relax and go back to sleep. And uh, yeah, so I, I just uh, took a shower and started drinking coffee at that point. So, so Charlie, turning to uh, your science for a moment, uh, you were well known uh, for your work on uh, yellow fever and uh, other related uh, viruses. What led you to turn your attention to uh, the hepatitis C virus? Well, it was really, I guess there were, there were a couple of factors. Um, you mentioned yellow fever, and uh, this was uh, a mosquito-borne virus, as you know, that has, has caused a, a lot of a lot of angst in the world, and, and uh, you know, there's a, a history there with, with sort of Rockefeller um, and uh, sort of Max Tyler actually um, developing a very safe and effective vaccine for yellow fever. And I, I was, uh, you know, sort of at, in 1989 when Mike Houghton sort of reported the sequence of this agent of non-A, non-B um, post-transfusion hepatitis. Um, we were studying yellow fever, and uh, it turned out that the that the sequence of of the viral genome um, pretty much placed it in this this family of viruses that we were already studying, and um, so we started a you know a very small um, effort um, on on the hepatitis C virus at that point, uh, really just trying to understand more about you know, how this, you know, very limited amount of genetic information, only 10,000 bases, um, could give rise to, you know, the various building blocks that the virus needed in order to, to, to replicate. And um, I think it was really our work in, in yellow fever that, uh, and, the, and the parallels that that had with what needed to be done in hepatitis C that, that put us in a, a reasonable position to to do something, um, but you know, I, I I can remember at the time that um, I felt that you know this was going to be sort of a, a short-lived um, area of investigation for us because you know at the time with the millions of people that were then uh, sort of clearly infected with this virus, um, I felt that um, you know the the pharmaceutical companies and sort of biotech and pharma were very rapidly going to be able to sort of take over the field. But, you know, this, this really did uh, pose some challenges to, you know, sort of conventional viruses. So that, 
turned out to not be at least the case initially. So yeah, I think yellow fever um, really put us in a good position because of the similarities in the type of virus, um, even though they're pretty distant relatives. Thank you. So perhaps we can open it up to uh, uh, reporter journalists to ask questions. Right, and uh, the, the way we're doing this is the questions that come in in writing, and I'll, I'll, I'll identify the question and the, uh, the questioner. Uh, the first question comes from Tina, uh, Tina Say at um, Science News, and she wants to know how your research enabled the development of drugs against hepatitis C. How were you involved in that, and how did the, your research enable that? Well, I think the, 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 the major contribution of, of our research, and I think I, I want to emphasize at the beginning that, um, you know, this is, is really a, uh, a global scientific effort that has sort of led to where we are today. But uh, sort of many of the, many of the tools that, um, that were developed to, to study hepatitis C, and these include, um, you know, molecular clones uh, that allow you to sort of launch um, the actual virus infection from a, a clone copy of the viral genetic material. Uh, that was sort of one thing that we sort of demonstrated uh, sort of initially um, in a primate model in, in 1997, as Rick said, after sort of identifying uh, together with Kunitata Shimitano in Japan, this missing piece um, at the three prime end of the genome, which is, is very highly conserved and really necessary for virus replication. But you know, that really wasn't the, the end of the story because even, even though uh, these molecules could sort of initiate infection in vivo in a primate model, uh, it still took um, years of, of work um, to figure out how to get these things and coax them to replicate in human liver cells and culture. And uh, certainly knowing what the, the sort of correct building blocks were, were important for doing that. But uh, the, a major breakthrough there was from Ralph Bartenschlager and Volker Lohmann uh, in Germany in reporting what we called the replicon system. And this was sort of a rare cell that could actually have a, a hepatitis C virus RNA replicating in it. And improvements of that system eventually created a, a laboratory tool that allowed um, people to either test drugs or candidate drugs that they had been developing against some of the viral enzymes like the uh, polymerase and the protease, uh, and also a system where you could actually find out if, if these inhibitory compounds that had been generated against these enzymes actually could get into cells and actually block uh, the ability of the sort of viral to replicate its genome. And that, uh, that also sort of eventually established a system where people could take an, um, a less biased approach and uh, take these cell-based uh, systems and actually screen compound libraries to identify sort of normal, novel uh, chemical inhibitors of the virus. So really it's a, it's a toolbox that allowed us to understand the nuts and bolts about, you know, sort of how this virus sort of replicates its genome and identify basically sort of Achilles heels that could then be uh, targeted. And certainly beyond, beyond those tools, um, the efforts of, of biotech and pharma to uh, identify compounds and hone them um, and show that they were clinically useful was really sort of what, uh, what uh, made the day uh, to, as Rick said, with these cocktails of inhibitors that we have today now that can cure more than 95% of the people that are uh, infected with this virus. That's great. Um, you know, that might uh, feed into a question we have from Daniel Trotta at uh, Reuters. He asks, what are the lessons learned from the research into hepatitis C that might be helpful in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Well, you know, two of the most uh, sort of the, the attractive targets for hepatitis C turned out to be uh, a, a protein that the virus needs to sort of cleave other cleave viral proteins, a protease, uh, and then a, a second uh, target, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And this is basically the, the sort of engine that makes the, the viral uh, sort of genome RNA. 
and um, the coronaviruses are sort of distantly related. Um, they have sort of a, a much larger genome. It's about uh, 30,000 sort of bases in length. But they do have uh, viral proteases uh, that the virus actually needs in order to replicate. And they also have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase and various other accessory proteins that um, sort of allow this machine to, to work. And uh, I think many people have heard about remdesivir. Um, this is a, uh, a nucleotide, uh, which is an inhibitor of the coronavirus RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And so really one of the cornerstones of ATV treatment is a similar class of inhibitors that targets the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And uh, so this is, again, some of the targets that I think people are most excited about um, for SARS-CoV-2 and preventing COVID-19 are, are essentially um, conceptually uh, the sort of same targets that turned out to win the war against hepatitis C, uh, at least in terms of, of treatments. So I think, yeah, we, you know, th these are sort of captive suspects and I think they're attractive as um, targets for drug development because these are, are virus specific. So they, these are functions that uh, in terms of the, the sort of details of how they work, uh, they often don't overlap with our own sort of cellular machinery. So you can hope to develop uh, drugs that are really targeting the virus and not having unwanted um, effects uh, on uh, side effects in people. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Annette uh, Brendel at BioWorld. She wants to, she, she observes that hepatitis B was identified long before hepatitis C, but there is no curative treatment for hepatitis B. And she, she wonders how it was that hepatitis C managed to leapfrog over hep B. Great question. Um, I mean, we do have very good uh, chemotherapies for hepatitis B that can really do a, a very good job at sort of suppressing the virus, but it really can't get rid of it. Um, I think in the case of hepatitis C, um, you know, hepatitis B and C really have very different um, sort of life cycles. And in the case of, of hepatitis C, as I mentioned before, this is a, a virus whose, whose genome is made up of, of RNA instead of DNA. And in the case of hepatitis B, uh, the sort of viral genome is, uh, uh, is DNA, and at least one form of that, uh, which is called covalently closed circular DNA, uh, persists in the nucleus and is very, very difficult to get rid of, uh, even if you have very effective treatments that will sort of suppress the virus replication. In the case of, of hepatitis C, it seems that it has, it's, it's more poised on the edge, and so that if you can actually sort of inhibit the ability of the machinery to sort of replicate uh, this viral RNA genome, uh, it can actually sort of effectively eliminate uh, the virus even from an infected cell. So that's very difficult to do with hepatitis B. But I, I do think that, and, and this, the question is, is right on the mark, that um, sort of the, the success of these drug treatments for hepatitis C and the fact that you can actually eliminate the virus, you can actually cure people, you can get rid of it, um, I think has renewed enthusiasm in people to see if we couldn't achieve that for other chronic viral infections like hepatitis B and, and HIV. And, uh, and that even if these viruses can't be completely eliminated from the body, at least we can sort of teach the body and have uh, agents that allow the virus to, you know, basically be kept in check uh, without sort of continuous treatment, uh, which is really the case for hepatitis B. So I think that's, that's an area of, of still great unmet need. Um, it's an area that, uh, you know, many people around the world are working towards for hepatitis B to now come up with at least what is a functional cure so that you wouldn't necessarily have to be taking a drug for your entire life. Right. Um, a number of questions that come in just, you know, you touched on this earlier, but uh, about your feelings uh, about, you know, after winning a, this prize, after 
you know, more than two decades of work, probably well over two decades of work, you know, what, what, what are the feelings that come with it? Well, I, 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 I you know, it's, you know, winning a prize is one thing, uh, but I, I would say that, uh, that, the, that the prize for all of us, um, you know, sort of working in this field, and, you know, that includes, you know, sort of Harvey Alter and Mike Houghton and all the other sort of investigators that have been part of it, um, just to have been um, a part of and a witness to, uh, you know, sort of going from, you know, basically a mystery virus uh, that's responsible for this post-transfusion hepatitis to, um, you know, having cocktails of drugs that can eliminate the virus usually without any side effects in more than 95% of the people that are chronically infected that get treated. Uh, and these are, you know, simple orally bioavailable, um, you know, regimens that as I said, have relatively few side effects and few uh, sort of drug-drug interactions that you have to worry about. Just, just sort of witnessing this happen, you know, over the last, you know, 25, 30 years has, I think, been, uh, for me, the, the greatest reward. Because I, I think, in, at least in my case, um, anything that, that we could contribute to this really just comes from a, an intrinsic curiosity about about viruses and sort of how they persist and um, understanding sort of more about how they work and uh, sort of the, the sort of chance opportunity of, of having a, uh, an important human pathogen sort of land in your family of viruses that you happen to be studying and uh, then go from um, you know, sort of basically the the beginning where it was discovered to, you know, when it can be successfully treated, this is kind of a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a rare treat for a basic scientist. Um. <laughs> right. Uh, we also have a couple of questions from different people. I'm interested in, um, uh, in how your mentors kind of led you into the line of work that you, you ended up now spending your life uh, pursuing. And and you know what what other what work by others has kind of has has laid a foundation for what you have been able to do. Well, I think um, you know I I would say that um, you know many things in science are you know sort of not not particularly novel. Um, you know they sort of they build on the the sort of findings of others, and I think that's certainly true for the sort of hepatitis C uh, field. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of, of, of my sort of mentors, um, I think, you know, in college, you know, sort of the, I, I, I view sort of my mentor as, as uh, someone who taught a biology class that, you know, really got me interested in, in biology. And um, in graduate school, I ended up landing in a, in a lab that studied uh, viruses. And these were actually arboviruses, uh, you know, viruses were transmitted by uh, insects like mosquitoes. And um, I think the, the gift that they, they gave me was really the freedom to explore. Um, you know, it wasn't like I was, you know, told what to do every day that I, you know, showed up in the lab. Um, you know, they didn't uh, sort of inhibit, they, provided guidance, but they didn't inhibit me from, you know, trying uh, things that might have been a little wild and crazy at the time. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's what I value a lot is, um, you know, really sort of the, the freedom to explore, the freedom to, you know, sort of make mistakes and learn from them and, and move on. But, you know, in terms of some of the, the, the approaches that we um, applied to studying yellow fever and then hepatitis C, um, you know, these these are, are are you know not earth shattering you know approaches. Other than hepatitis C, just turned out to be a lot more difficult to crack um, than some of these other viruses. So a lot of the previous work from others in the virology field, uh, going back to even bacteriophage work. Um, you know, sort of informed our thinking and, and how to proceed. 
it, basically, where, where do you think virology is going now? And what would you give uh, as advice for students of virology right now? What, what, uh, what guidance might you give them? Yeah, well, guidance for young virologists, I guess we're, we're sort of in the middle of a sort of a major uh, sort of virology education. Um, and um, I think that, uh, you know, the field has definitely changed, uh, you know, since the days when I was a graduate student. And um, I think one of the, the things that is, is very sort of reassuring now is um, really the global response to this, this pandemic in the, in the sort of academic and clinical and, you know, sort of pharma communities, the, the sort of rate of progress. I mean, it took us, you know, sort of months and months of, of, of toil to sequence a single viral genome. Now people can do that in a matter of hours. Um, and the rate at which people have been able to sort of make progress on understanding SARS-CoV-2 and, uh, and COVID-19 is just spectacular. And um, so I think it's, it, it's taught us a lot of things about science in general. If there's really a, a, a pressing problem and um, we sort of you know, mobilize people all around the world to sort of work on these problems, really, you know, great progress can be made. And I, I think we're gonna, you know, people would love to have a cure in a week or, some, or a vaccine in a week. I mean, that's not feasible, but the, the speed with which um, I think sort of good therapeutics and, and vaccines will be developed um, for SARS-CoV-2 to prevent COVID-19 is uh, going to be uh, spectacular. Um, and it, it's, it has a way of, I think, you know, really sort of changing the way that science is done to really make it, you know, sort of more of a community uh, effort rather than something that, you know, many years ago might have been pursued by a few labs in isolation. Um, so I think the, the sort of young virologists today just have this amazing collection of uh, tools and capabilities um, to understand what's going on in virus biology and and the host response at a level that was just never before possible. So I'm 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 very uh, uh, optimistic on the sort of future of this, and I, I do hope that um, maybe the success with hepatitis C and what I would predict the sort of eventual success in sort of getting a handle on the current coronavirus pandemic that we face will you know sort of encourage us to. Um, not only recruit more virologists, but uh, also, you know, just sort of encourage people to to, to study these uh, little troublemakers because you never know when they're going to pop up and cause trouble. So um, it's worth a it's worth a small investment, and they're fascinating machines. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a great place to stop. Um, I want to thank everyone who managed to stick with us through our, our technical glitch. Um, I do think it's a it's a reflection of the fact that a, a good many people um, uh, are listening in right this minute. Um, just a reminder to everyone listening, you can find updated information about Dr. Rice and his research on our website, rockefeller.edu, including photos and videos and a recording of this press conference. Maybe we'll edit out dark patch um, uh, will be available online shortly as well. Uh, so in closing, I hope you'll all join me in congratulating Dr. Rice for this truly really spectacular recognition of his remarkable science and his achievements. Thank you. Uh, the press conference is now concluded.